Let's get joined up. Today's show is brought to you by Audible, and right now you can get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com forward slash joined up. There's over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle or MP3 player. So thanks for tuning in to the Joined Up Writing podcast, a regular show about all things writing, including interviews with authors, screenwriters and key figures from the publishing industry. Plus loads of hints, tips and inspiration for all creatives. You can follow us on Twitter at JU Podcast, leave a quick iTunes review or just tell a friend. Hello and welcome to the Joined Up Writing Podcast, where a little procrastination can go a long way. I'm Wayne Kelly and it's episode 140 with Jo Thomas, food-inspired romance novelist, here to talk to me about her journey from radio producer to mother to prolific author and why she's so passionate about writing. Now, I usually record these conversations days and sometimes weeks ahead of broadcast, but I spoke to Jo this very morning and I'm still feeling positive and inspired by what she had to say, so I know you'll enjoy it too. Joe talked about not putting things off and it's something that's been on my mind anyway a lot of late because of stuff that's been going on in my family life. Many years ago when I was in my late teens my grandma surprised us all one day by revealing that for years she'd been secretly writing down poems, musings and snippets of her life on odd scraps of paper that she kept hidden away in a drawer. Now for whatever reason she decided to let us in and I can still remember the day she sat by the window and read some of them particularly a fairly scathing and funny poem about how she ran around looking after my lazy granddad. I was awestruck, but it was a surprise to everyone in the family, including my dad, who thought he knew everything about his mum, and even my granddad, who'd already been married to her for decades by that point. But it also seemed to be like the missing piece of a jigsaw for me. I'd been obsessed with writing and words since I could hold a pen, and to me, anyway, this just seemed to come out of nowhere. No one else in the family showed any talent or interest, and in any case, we, you know, we were a very working-class bunch with not a great deal of formal education between us. And my gran had left school at 14 with no qualifications and we were never the kind of family to sit down and discuss our feelings or get into arty or intellectual topics of conversation. And yet there she was hiding this talent like some dirty little secret and snatching rare moments of solitude to put her thoughts to paper. Now, unfortunately, my grandma is now suffering from dementia and to my utmost regret and shame, I never sat down with her for a one-to-one conversation to ask her about where all this stuff came from, where she found the time and, and what else she may have written that we didn't even get to hear. The dementia has been rapid and, to be honest, it's kind of blindsided us all. But I recently remembered her writing and wondered what had happened to it. And I discovered that many of the scraps of paper that she used to write on seemed to be missing or lost, but that a few years ago she did copy some of them into an exercise book. Now, there are only like nine poems in this book, but I decided I wanted to make something more permanent and designed a small hardback book using an online photo book service, and I've had a few copies printed for the family. It was an emotional experience reading them again after so many years. It got me thinking how she deprived herself or at least never allowed herself to fulfil her potential or or show any of her artistic side to those closest to her until much later in life. It also made me realise just how privileged I am to be able to live a creative life, to pursue my writing, to express myself and share it with the world and all the other stuff that I do. And how, like many of us, I sometimes squander that privilege by wasting time or using self-doubt to avoid just getting on with it. Tomorrow I'm going to be taking a copy of the book to my gran and I've no idea if she'll even recognise it as her own work or remember what inspired her to write some of these things. Without wanting to get too philosophical, it strikes me that we're all too complacent when it comes to recording the present because there's something that we all take for granted and that's our memory. It, it's become the stuff of cliche. A, a person lives on in your memories. We'll always have Paris. I'll never forget that day, etc., etc. But the truth is, one day, even that could be snatched from us. So live in the moment, yes, but make sure you share it with others. Spread the memories around. Tell them how you feel. Write it down. And most of all, as Joe says in today's interview, don't put off until tomorrow what you could do today. 
Now, if you hang around until the end of the show, I'll read you a short poem my gran wrote about her own mother. And the last line really drives home what I'm talking about. Anyway, sorry to get so heavy. Fortunately, Joe's interview is upbeat and inspirational and on the subject of seizing the day. So tell me what you lot are doing out there. I want to hear about your projects, your problems, your trials, your tribulations. So get in touch by tweeting me at JU Podcast, emailing wayne at waynekellywrites.com or dropping me a line on the FB page. And don't forget to join the email mailing list at joinedupwriting.co.uk. It's totally free. And you can read a couple of my short stories when you sign up and you'll be the first to find out about upcoming shows and events. Right, let's get on to today's interview with Joe Thomas. Joe worked for many years as a reporter and producer for BBC Radio 5, Radio 4 and Radio 2. In 2013, she won the RNA Katie Ford bursary and her debut novel, The Oyster Catcher, was a bestseller in ebook and was awarded the 2014 RNA Joan Hessein Award and the 2014 Festival of Romance Best Ebook Award. And her latest book, Finding Love at the Christmas Market, is out right now. So enjoy the chat and I'll pop back at the end. Okay, Joe, thanks so much for coming on Joined Up Writing. Really appreciate it. So why don't you just start off just by giving us a sense of where you're speaking from and and how things are going for you at the minute? Well, thanks for having me. It's lovely to be here. I'm I'm tucked away writing. I'm in West Wales uh, and I'm looking from my desk down to the sea which is idyllic sounds like yeah it's it's I want to say it's um different shades of gray the sea this morning but it sort of goes from baby blue to sort of slate gray it's beautiful so um I sit here at my desk uh and I'm working on next Christmas's book next Christmas's book yeah yeah so I have this Christmas's book out now um next summer's book is ready to go so we're just signing off on all of that and I'm so whilst I might be sitting at my desk looking out to see my head is actually in Normandy uh, in France. (laughs) Brilliant so do you not find with that gorgeous view that you sometimes get distracted? Uh, No not really I find more and more these days that I love light uh, to work in and I think probably that's always been there because when I started writing um, as uh, I've said many times before, I had three children under the age of three. Mm-hmm. Um, they're a bit like buses. You wait for years and three come <laughs> along at once. Um, and so I used to, when you get on that kind of like, uh, you drop in one off at nursery, one off at play group, and the baby goes to sleep in the car. And I used to pull up wherever I was and pull out my laptop and write in the car. Yeah. And I used to think that that was about... Um, being sort of confined and concentrated and I had that one hour in the day when the baby would sleep and I would start trying to write short stories and things um but the more I think about it I wonder whether it was the light that I enjoyed sitting in the car um then we we moved as a family to Ireland uh for a year it was supposed to be Mm -hmm. and I went to put the children into school and I discovered I couldn't get them into an English language school uh they could only go into irish language well they were actually in welsh language school (laughs) so i moved them from welsh language to irish language school and i remember dropping them off at school that first day and they're looking at me and to say what on earth are you doing to us and i drove down the coast road um along galway bay and i pulled up um left the kids crying I was crying and I pulled up and I looked out at the sea and I didn't want to go home and I thought well you can either sit here crying for an hour Joe or you can write a book so every day I sat in the car and wrote and I wrote the oyster catcher there yeah and um and then when finally I got uh, a, a traditional deal and I got um I sold to Germany I bought a camper van so that I could write in the car and have a desk and make a cup of tea so I think light has always been actually yeah, quite important Yeah sounds like to it me. is yeah <laughs> sounds like it is Well let's let's um before we get rush rush headlong into all that stuff why don't you tell us about you kind of touched on it briefly there but tell us about your your latest book which is Finding Love at the Christmas Market which by the way my wife took on holiday with us we went we were looking before this lockdown and everything we actually went 
for a week uh, we went to Brixham in Devon and she took it with her with her and she absolutely loved it so she told me to pass that on for you she, oh she, I'm she, delighted she, thank she, her. she said she had a really lovely warm feeling when she finished it so good yeah she loved it so yeah so tell us about that well, um, this is about a woman who later in life, you know, she's had her child, he's gone to university, um, decides to embrace uh, internet dating, but she hasn't had much luck at all. And for a day job, she delivers ready meals to um, retirement, her co- sorry, retirement flats. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, one of the residents decides to set her up on a blind date uh internet date uh, and it's in the german christmas markets so our girl connie is taking uh, a mini bus load of pensioners to the german christmas markets to go on her blind date i mean what could possibly go wrong <laughs> brilliant and so, and so like a lot of your books well it seems to be when i was researching this so a lot of your inspiration kind of comes from food and kind of your own travel experience but what was the what would you say was the jumping off point for this book when i start writing a book it's like i'm walking into the pantry of an evening and saying what am i going to cook for tea uh-huh. and i might decide i want to do something italian or something greek um and you sort of start with the main ingredient and then build up around it So for this one, I knew that I wanted to do the German markets. And so gingerbread, I knew was going to be at the heart of that. And I find with all the books that I've written, as as you say, that the inspiration generally comes from food and place. Mm -hmm. Because I find that once you find the food of an area, it kind of takes you by the hand and introduces you to the the history of the place, the community, the people, the way of life. It just sort of takes you around the the city walls and and tells you everything you need to know about the place. The first thing I do whenever I go and travel anywhere is go to the market and and discover, you know, what's for sale, what's local, and I want to cook with it. Mm -hmm. And that's how all my books start. When I wrote The Oyster Catcher, um, I would say we were invited to go to Ireland for a year with my husband's work and we got there and it rained and rained and rained. it didn't stop raining and I wanted to go to a really good seafood restaurant um, so we were we were told where to go and we went in and it was like walking into somebody's front room the fire was going the candles were lit and I sat down at this table in the window and just for a little while, it stopped raining. And this sort of <laughs> silver shadow came across the water. And I thought, oh, okay, that's Galway Bay. Mm. And this plate of oysters was put down in front of me. Uh, and I ate these oysters that were amazing. And with Galway Bay outside, and I went, this is sexy. This is what I want to write about. And yeah. then I discovered about, you know, the shell shucking competitions and, 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 and how that really is woven into the weave of the community. So very much that's where all my books start. So I wanted Germany, I wanted the Christmas markets, and I wanted the traditional gingerbread um, that is baked there. And that's what's at the heart of the story. I kind of took you off on the journey. Well, exactly. Why, why do you think people connect so much through kind of shared food experiences in the third, first place? They really do. They really do. I mean, you can talk to to most people and they have food memories and whether it be a terrible meal or whether it be something really simple that they've shared with someone they love. You know, food is such an expression of love when you cook a meal for someone, you know, you're putting yourself, you know, your heart on a plate almost. Mm. And um, I just find I mean, for us in particular, you know, we do all gather around the table every evening it's where we celebrate it's where we commiserate it's where we have our arguments <laughs> everything yeah. happens at the kitchen table and i was writing my second book the olive branch about um the olive groves in puglia in southern italy and i went to a restaurant there and been there quite a few times with my brother who was living there and the owner came at the end of the meal and he sat down with us and he put out the glasses and poured the limoncello and you know he didn't speak English I didn't really speak Italian but he said to me what kind of books do you write and I said well I write romantic fiction about food and he said he's uh, he said for me he said life is all about the food that we grow here and he sort of put out his hand to the uh, olive grove he said to cook in the forno which was blazing away mm-hmm. he said 
to put on the table and he banged the sort of the, the pine scrub table. He said to put on the table, he said, for the ones we love. And he, and he hit his fist to his chest. And I thought, that's what my books are all about. It's about the food that we put on the table for the ones we love. Uh, and that's at the heart of all my books. It's, it's the food. It's about food and love uh, and their relationship. And hopefully a lot of fun thrown in as well. Yeah. Well, well, let, you kind of hinted it in the little intro there, but just, let's go all the way back then. So tell us a little bit about your background, where you grew up and what your kind of earliest memory of writing was. Oh, well, I I had no ideas to be a writer when I was growing up. Well, maybe I did because I used to sit there and get blank notebooks and scribble in them. So obviously I had this idea that maybe being a writer was a nice life, but I didn't really want to put in the hard work. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I went on um, to work for in BBC Radio. Mm -hmm. And I started at BBC uh, Radio 5, uh, came back to Wales. I didn't grow up in Wales, but um, uh, I came down for a weekend over 30 years ago. And, and you know, the rest is history sort of thing. <laughs> <laughs> Met a man and married and I've stayed gotcha. here ever since. Um, and, uh, so, and, then, and then I worked for BBC Radio 2. And as I say, I didn't really have an idea at that time that I wanted to write. Although looking back, there were possibly little signs that, that I did. Um, and then say I had three small children and I wanted something for me and, and, and something that I could do from the kitchen table. And I started writing short stories and it took me two years really to learn my craft in writing short stories because everyone thinks you can just sit down and Right. Yeah. Well, it wasn't like that for me. It was two years to learn to write a publishable short story. Yeah, and sure. then, you know, it was about eight years before I finally got my first novel published. And in that time, did you find so the first one that got published? Was that the first one that you'd finished? I mean, that's that's unusual if it was, but usually no. lots of people have had lots of either failed attempts or yes. you know, they finished and then moved on to the next one. Was that oh, the same many, for you? many failed attempts. There were about four failed novels in the drawer before I finally wrote The Oyster Catcher. Um, and what? by this time, I, I thought I'm never going to be published, you know. <laughs> I rather like this gang I hang out with and all the, you know, Romantic Novelist Association do's. Um, and then I, I did get approached by uh, a small independent Welsh publisher who said, can I put your book out as an e-book? And I said, oh, you don't want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> she said, no, really, I do. I said, oh, OK, then. Um, so I thought, well, I'll, I'll just let this go out as an e-book and then later on I'll write something a bit better. Um, and so it did go out as an ebook, The Oyster Catcher, mm -hmm. and it rose up through the Kindle charts. It went to number two in the Kindle charts, where it sat for many weeks in between 12 Years a Slave and uh, The Book Thief. Wow. Um, and then I got approached by um, the bigger publishing companies who started to contact me. And and in this time, I still didn't have an agent uh, when I, this first got published. You know, I'd been rejected by all the agents that I'd approached. One who said, I can't see where you'd sit on the shelf. Mm. I wanted to reply and say, in between the book thief and 12 years, <laughs> it will do. It's obvious. <laughs> well, and actually, yes, she contacted me uh, once I, I went to went into the Kindle charts and said, you know, do you still have representation? You mm. know, still, are you still looking for representation? Yeah. Um, so it just goes to show you have to just keep going because I then did get uh, an agent and I secure. I went to um, auction with the big publishing houses and secured a four book deal and um, three novellas, I think four books and three novellas with headline publishing. Um, and that was when it really started. And overnight, it can, you know, it's not an overnight success because you've been working years and years of and course, years yeah. to actually learn your craft. But um, it did all change then very quickly. Uh, and so then I did eight books uh, and three novellas with headline. Um, and then last year, moved to Transworld Publishing, who I'm with now. Wow. So during those times that we won't call them failed novels, they were they, you were learning, you're learning your craft. <laughs> part, of the learn, part of the journey, we like to call them. Exactly. Was there any point during that where you thought, oh, this is just silly. Like, why am I bothering to do it? Or was, did you just, or was it, but did you obviously got something out of it anyway, regardless of the fact they weren't going anywhere or you weren't, you know, getting them out into the world. You must have been getting something from it and you, something that was driving you on. 
I think it's like if you decided to join a gym, you know, and you wanted to go from from being, you know, <laughs> quite large and overweight to being super fit. You mm. know, there are just days where you think this is just not going anywhere. Why am I bothering? You know, um, but something in you just says keep going. And you do. And then suddenly you'll get a little bit of success, like setting a short story or something. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it all started to turn for me once I was I was writing The Oyster Catcher in 2013. Um, and I got awarded the Katie Ford bursary with the Romantic Novelist Association, mm-hmm. which is for writers who are sort of nearly there. <laughs> you know, They just need an extra push over the finish line. Yeah. And that was the turning point for someone to actually have some faith in what you were doing. Uh, and then The Oyster Catcher got published and then it all moved from there. So it's, yes, little windows of hope keep you going. But there were so many times I thought, oh, this is useless. Why am I doing this? You know, <laughs> <laughs> why, why? Um, but you do. I mean, it's just if you really want something, you'll keep going, won't you? And and also the thing about writing a novel, which is it's a good chunk of time. Mm. But I tend to think of it if you were running a marathon, you don't just start and think about the end. Mm-hmm. You think, well, I'm doing this section next mm-hmm. and then I'm going to run this section. Mm-hmm. You know, you have to take it in bite sized pieces um, so that you don't sort of think, oh, I've got to write a novel. You, well, no, you've just got to write the next bit of a novel every day, you know. Yeah, to keep you going. So, yeah. so with the Oyster Catcher, do, do you think there was anything different about it? I mean, I'm guessing it was probably better because, as you say, you'd learn and you'd probably learn your craft more. But was the was it in the same? Had you been writing in pretty much the same genre or do you think this kind of magical food experience that you'd had that kind of was the jumping off point for that novel do you think there was something about it that you kind of found something that worked for you something that clicked I think there were three things that clicked there uh, one was I you know people keep saying you write about what you know and I thought I don't know about anything you know <laughs> you, and me I both. Have, you know I don't have some <laughs> hobby I don't have an allotment or you know keep horses or have this amazing you know, experience of anything. And I thought, what do I know about? And I thought, I'm, I, I like food, but I thought I'm not a chef. I don't have fancy knives or anything. Mm-hmm. And I'm not a farmer. And then I thought, but I am someone who is interested in food. Mm. I do. I love to feed my family. I love to feed my friends. And it's simple home cooking. Mm. Um, and I love, but I do love the idea of, of, knowing where the food has come from and it's just good ingredients and say when I'm in Italy or oh, you know I wanted to know about the olive oil the first thing I do is go to a market I mean before iPads I took Nigel Slater on every holiday that I went mm-hmm. on you know he was in my bag as a, as a paperback and I would cook um so it was discovering who I am and what I actually really enjoyed in life. And the thing is, write about what you enjoy because you're going to be in this world for quite a long time. Um, and then, so there was that difference. Then another difference was um, that I was away with some writers and I was writing in the third person. And someone suggested to me, in fact, it was the writer Veronica Henry, said to me, Joe, have you ever thought about writing? first person uh because you've got quite a strong voice and I thought I'm not sure if that's a compliment (laughs) (laughs) damning you with faint praise (laughs) (laughs) so exactly so I thought I'm gonna have a go at a paragraph Mm -hmm. and I sat down to write a paragraph of of what I was working on and it was like someone had taken off my stabilizers off my bike Mm -hmm. and I was just whoosh off you know I couldn't get over the finish line and this was the way that just sort of catapulted me forward because all my books are about basically a character that is very much like me put it because I can get myself into all sorts of trouble in an empty (laughs) room put in a place out you know fish out of water wanting to learn more um and so once I started to write first person then the story really took off and I could go on the adventure with my characters. Uh, And then one other piece of advice I had was, um, and it came to me in a couple of different, from a couple of different sources really. Um, But it was, do you know what? Just get on and finish, which was don't get stuck, keep going and go back and fill in the blanks afterwards. Mm -hmm. Um, Which was much the same as my first editor said to me, she said, Joe, it's all about layering. And it is, it's about, 
drawing the outline of uh, your watercolor and then filling it in afterwards and 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 putting in the layers. So it was very much finding my voice in physically whilst I was writing in the first person and discovering what I really wanted to write about and then just actually getting over the line and finishing it and then going back and filling you know filling in the blanks and that's how you suddenly get into your rhythm of or, or how I suddenly got my rhythm of writing. That's how you sort of found it. So when you when you started ostensibly sort of almost out of the blue to just sit down and start to write, you say you've got, as you say, you've got three little children and you're, mm. you know, you're snatching moments here and there and you're writing in the car and all that sort of stuff. Did you let your family into that world from an early point or was it something that you were kind of doing in the background and you were sort of keeping quiet? Did you share it with anybody early on? Oh, I never showed anyone when I was writing because it was all rubbish. Um, you know, they knew what I was doing. Often I would um, wake at four before the baby woke mm -hmm. at six uh, just to try and get in a bit of writing. So they knew that I was doing this, but I didn't show anyone what I was actually writing. <laughs> uh, and even now, that's how it stays. It doesn't get um, – I have – we have a group of writers um, – we all get together on a Friday now for a Zoom call. That's got us through lockdown. Mm -hmm. We have a, there's a bunch of us who, uh, you know, Jill Mansell, Katie Ford. You know, we we kind of get together on a Friday and we have a good old chin wag about the week. But um, I'm very lucky that uh, Katie Ford and I do a lot of travelling together. And those who follow us on uh, Facebook or Twitter know that we go off on our research trips together and have great fun. Mm -hmm. um, so. And we'll go off on writing retreats together as well. There'll be a bunch of us. We'll go and um, stay in France, maybe, and, and go on a, a writing retreat. And we always get together for tea around the, the table in the morning and we bounce ideas around and work out plot problems. And then we go off and write. So I have that. And, and often in the mornings, email is great. We'll be there email in the morning. In fact, this morning, just before I've been talking to you, I've been sorting out a plot problem I had. And um, so that happens. But But outside of our little group really you know the first person who gets to see the the book is is the editor yeah you still you still sort of keep it keep it quiet yeah. so to speak and you kind of mentioned earlier you worked for a long time in radio both as a producer and a reporter so how do you think that part of your life feeds into what you write now would you say oh I really do think it was a big part of it I mean firstly I worked on daily magazine programs mm -hmm. and uh, if you didn't have an item for that morning you were going to have dead air. You you thought of something. There's no time for <laughs> a bit yeah. of a block. Yeah. You you would have to look around and say, well, what am I going to put on that show today? Mm -hmm. um, and and find a guest and find out about it very quickly. Do your research. You know, you say you might go in the morning, a guest has dropped out, and you need to find out about something and find a guest very quickly uh, without dithering around. So I think that became really important because I'm now writing two books a year. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so that kind of crack on uh, training, <laughs> I think, was very important. Uh, and also a lot of the subjects that we covered, because I was saying in daily magazine programs, so it was a lot of cookery, there was gardening, um, lifestyle, and also people's personal stories as well and their emotional stories. So all of that, I think, feeds into the sort of stories that I write now. And how you sort of approach it. Do you, do you think to a certain extent as you say because you it was you did that for a job and you had to kind of think creatively on your feet and quickly do you think that's kind of taken because sometimes what you get with some writers and or, or some aspiring writers is that side of it the creative side of it the thinking up ideas or whatever you want to call it this kind of it's almost like shrouded in mystery and magic and you have to wait for the muse and you know this thing may or may not come do you do you think your job that side of it sort of took out of that mystery and that, that that sort of part of it and it's just like well it's just something that needs to be done I need another idea for another book because I've got another one to write yes I mean I think and and but because I was working in magazine programs so you had a you had a sort of area that you had to think within you know you knew the sort of idea you want yeah. so once you work out the sort of books you want to write so for me as I say it's about food and love um you start to, th you know, the ideas come all the time mm -hmm. uh, within what I want to write. If you said to me, right, go and write something else, anything you like that isn't about this, I'd kind of go, oh, my word. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, whereas inside 
what I write. And because it's about who I am and what I enjoy, the idea is, you know, my poor agent, I'm emailing him most mornings going, now I've had an idea for this. And uh, <laughs> um, he squirrels them all away in case I forget them. Um, so I think, I think it's, you know, on the one hand, it feeds creativity because you're, you're very much in that zone of uh, everywhere you look, oh, that might be an idea. Mm-hmm. Oh, that might be an idea. Mm-hmm. So it can really sort of um, feed the flames, as it were. Mm-hmm. Uh, outside of that, if you said go off and write about anything else other than that, I'd be probably a bit stumped. But, you, um, yeah, you like the fact you almost create sort of some limitations for yourself or at least give yourself some rails to sort of stay, stay yeah. on. Yeah, and uh, that's 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 you know, as I say, it's me on a plate. It's who I am. It's what I am. It's what interests me. But we you know if I'm not working, I'm reading cookery books, or mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> or yeah. I'm cooking, you know, um, or I'm visiting markets. So it's very much everything, everything that I feeds enjoy. into it. Yeah. Mm. So tell us a little bit about your approach. Your your approach. Do you plan um, where, where and when do you write now? I mean, obviously, at one stage you were getting up at four o'clock in the morning and trying to fit yeah. it around small children. But so, if you were starting yeah. something new tomorrow, how would you approach it? Well, um, what's quite lovely is that now I have teenagers, and in fact, two teenagers have gone to university this year, um, and and the other ones, you know, they stay in bed so that you're not disturbed, so you yeah. can get up a little bit later. That's great. Uh, and and work. Um, so as I said, I start with a place and a food, and I. Th- think to myself why would I be going there why would I be going to this place and why do I want to find out about this food um so so there is a list for tomorrow tomorrow (laughs) day after and I think you know where you know where do I want to visit next and what's the food I really want to discover and then um I have to write up a synopsis now because you I think you you know it's you've got to know where you're driving to. It's mm-hmm. a map mm-hmm. and you've got to know what the end point is going to be. But if, you know, I take the scenic route along the way, um, that's fine. But to start with, I need to know roughly what the story is. In fact, when I'm really stuck, I play the game Consequences. Have you ever played Consequences? No, tell us, tell us about that. <laughs> you know where you go, uh, once upon a time, there was a girl called so-and-so, and then you turn over the page and you pass it on to the next person. <laughs> I see, right, yeah. Right? Uh, and they met, and this happened. Yeah. Um, so I'll just do that, and you go, yeah, yeah, that's got some legs. And yeah. then, you know, work through then some of the bigger questions about what is it that your your heroine is trying to achieve, and what is it they really need in their life as opposed to what they want. Um, and uh, and once I think you can work out what the conflict is, what they need, what they want, and what the end point is, then and then I have to start with. I usually start with a prologue. I like to come in with a bang and mm. set something up, uh, and then I think I'm generally away. Then then off you go. Yeah. So it's kind of a synopsis. But do you, do you really? You know, I mean, some people, they will literally do, you know, well, chapter 17, no. this happens. No, you just you've kind of got your story. And then once you're off, you're off and you, you're off to the races. Yeah, because that's when, you know, you can really enjoy the creativity. You don't know what the hook is going to be in that chapter. And things change as you're going along. Um it's like starting out with, uh, I remember Anita Burra saying to me, it's like starting out with a lump of clay. Mm-hmm. You know, and you get it into a rough shape and get the first draft done. And then you can really start to mold it into how you want it to be. So, you know, things change as you start writing the book and things will come to you. And uh, say another writer, uh, Rowan Coleman, I remember her saying, I keep writing until um and I can't, what, how did she describe it? Until the glitter comes, something, until the shine comes. You mm-hmm. know, you keep writing yeah. and then something occurs. You go, oh, yes, that's the special thing. Mm-hmm. And you, so you just have to keep going and it will, it, you know, it will start to shine. And you mentioned there you talked about having a hook in, in a chapter. What does that mean for you? What, how do you sort of approach that? Um, sometimes for me, the hook is about driving the story forward. Mm-hmm. Um, it could be for other people. It's about keeping them reading, you know, till late in the night. But for me, I think if you've got a hook to the end of uh, the end of a chapter, it's about what's going to happen next. Mm-hmm. Uh, you've either put your character in a situation where you think, how is she going to deal with this? Or 
that wasn't what I expected. And it's about just keeping the story moving forward. Absolutely. So obviously you've been writing for a long time now and there's lots of books. You've obviously put out lots of books and stuff like that. How would you say your process has changed, if at all, since you wrote that first novel? What what sorts of things did you learn along along the way of those those learning novels, we'll call them, at the beginning? What did you, what did <laughs> yeah, you learn? Yeah, no, I, you learn your own process. You know, that, that, there isn't one particular way that works for everybody. You learn, you take a little bit of advice from lots of people. Mm-hmm. Um and you learn your own process. As I say, I write a synopsis, and a story outline, really. Um, and then I need to get going. And then I'll do three drafts before it goes to my editor. Um, so you learn your own pattern and, and, and get into you, your own rhythm. Yeah. What were you kind of doing differently, do you think, at the beginning that maybe do you know, wasn't working? I so. think at the beginning... I tried to read too many books and go to too many classes and take on board too much advice Mm -hmm. instead of just sitting down and enjoying telling a story that, you know, just get it over the finish line, get to the end, get on with it, you know, beginning a muddle and an end and sort it out later, Mm -hmm. you know, tell a story and enjoy the story. Um, And as I say, there's an awful lot of how to books and, and at the end of the day, I think once you once I stopped reading those, it's a bit like having children again. Once you stop reading the how to books, yeah. you find you will get on a lot easier <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and just find your own way of muddling through. Yeah. Find your own way is, uh, is good advice anyway. I think you're right. I think lots of us. I mean, in on the one hand, you know, I mean, I like reading all that stuff. I mean, a lot of it is entertaining and you know, you kind of can get something else out of it often, even if it's just the inspiration to go and write. But you, you're, you, you're spot on with what you say. If you're not careful, you can get yourself into a bit of a model yeah. thinking, oh, you know, so and so. I've got to like do it that. like this oh, yeah, and I've yeah. got to do it like that. Just, you know, work out what you enjoy reading, work out what you want to write, you know, and and start. I mean, as I say, I do break it down. I break it down into... um section so that you're not just sitting there looking at a blank page and I sort of think well I know I want this to happen after the first quarter maybe this then to change Mm -hmm. Um, and so just taking in bite-sized pieces but have a story to start with so you're not just running off into the wilderness (laughs) and uh, (laughs) wondering which way to turn know where you're going to go and then enjoy getting there absolutely that's great advice so have you a a long way at all have you ever ever been tempted to change genre or try something else no (laughs) well that's that's good there's less distractions if but because you know so you talk to some writers and it's almost like you know they're like it's almost like new ideas like you know been in the sweet shop it's like they all look great let's just get everything it's kind of like that but sometimes you know you have to you do have to focus on it's great if you know what you enjoy and what you think you're good at and then you know you could just crack on with that well, I, I was speaking to a friend of mine the other day, and um, and she's now decided to have a go at crime. I, I don't want to have a go at crime. I don't read crime. Why would I want to write crime? Yeah. When I sit down to watch a film, I sit down and think, right, I'd like something set somewhere lovely. Um, <laughs> and I'd like it to be a romance. I'd like, oh, yeah. maybe some food involved. And I think, oh, well, do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's just yeah, what you. I enjoy. It's yeah. who I am. And and I hope that it brings a lot of other people joy too. You know, I'm very lucky to get a lot of messages from people saying that it's given them escapism in this time. And and like you said, like your, warm, like your wife, a warm feeling, you know, yeah, yeah. is just an escape right now. Somewhere happy where... Uh, as a friend of mine will say, it's like stepping into a warm bath. Mm-hmm. You know, you're going to have a nice time. I want people to feel like they've come to my house, had dinner. You know, they've had a few laughs and um, some good food, good wine, nice company, and they go away feeling very happy. Yeah, well, as I say, you mentioned that my wife definitely felt like that. She loves Christmas anyway. Um, so yeah, it was uh, she. She absolutely loved loved it and the experience that she she got from it so Good. kind of as we move towards wrapping things up, what what would you say has been the most helpful piece of creative or inspirational advice that somebody's given to you and it might not necessarily have to be specific to writing it could have been something else that's kind of fed into that oh um I, I was going to say it was that advice about the layering it's all about layering because you you know you can write a first draft and think oh this is dreadful uh-huh. but you know don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. go back start making it better because 
if you've got something, something can be made better. Mm -hmm. If you just sit there looking at a blank page, well, you can't do anything with that. Um, but I do remember I was working for Radio 2 and I was working on a series of um, interviews about people who'd had terrible problems with sleep. And a man who completely changed his life. He'd gone from working in the city um, to having a breakdown, really, sitting on the tube one day and having a breakdown. And he retrained and he was um, uh, a physiotherapist, physiotherapist, you know. And I went to interview him about his life and how he needed to change it. And he had uh, some kind of um, picture on the wall that said, you know, it, it was sort of a don't don't dream it, be it, but... And I was reading it and he said, what would you do if you could do anything? And I laughed. I said, oh, I'd be Ginny Cooper. <laughs> well, clearly I'm not Ginny Cooper, but Ginny Cooper is Ginny Cooper. Yeah. But um, it is that kind of thing of, of finding your world and what you want to write about. And finally, I found that I am where I want to be. I'm writing about my world, what I enjoy. And, um, and it's a nice place to be. So I think don't put off till tomorrow what you really want to do today i think if we've learned anything from these times we've been living through it's not to put things off if there's something you really want to do go for it that's great advice and that's a nice place to wrap things up so just before we do that just remind people uh where they can find um love uh, at the christmas market um and um and also what you've got coming up and what what's kind of ahead of us so finding love at the christmas market is out now set in the german christmas markets you can get that it's 99p on amazon kindle for the whole of november wow um it's uh in the supermarkets in your bookshops um you should be able to get it anywhere actually <laughs> or as i say go online and 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 visit your local bookshops online as well who really could do with our support right now as well um uh, so that's out now. Then next May and June, I've got um, Chasing the Italian Dream coming out. That is set in a small town outside of Naples in Italy in a little lemon-covered courtyard pizzeria called Nonno's. Nice. And uh, that takes on the world of of pizza making. Um and I am writing next winter's book set in Normandy with cream and Calvados and cider. Um, and that's where I am in my head right now. Do you, you must get hungry writing all these books. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> I know I would. And so where, where can people find out more about you online, Joe? Well, you can follow me on Twitter. I'm always on Twitter. I love that. So do come and find me on Twitter, Joe uh, underscore Thomas 01. Uh, Facebook, I'm on Facebook a lot, Joe Thomas author. And I'm just attempting to get to grips with Instagram. Uh, so, um, again, I think that's Joe Thomas writes. Uh, come and find me on Instagram and show me how to use it. But, uh, you know, if you like food, if you like talking about places you'd like to have lunch, uh, what you might be rustling up with your leftovers, um, come and find me. Absolutely. Food is everywhere. Well, thanks so much, Joe. It's been an absolute pleasure to speak to you. Good luck with the, the book and everything else that's coming up. But for the time being, thanks a million for coming on Joined Up Writing. Thank you so much for having me. Joined Up Writing. There you have it. Thanks again to Joe Thomas, whose book Finding Love at the Christmas Market is available right now. So if you want a heartwarming slice of Yuletide goodness, go get it. And I'll put all of her links in the show notes over at joinedupwriting.co.uk. Before we go, I did say I would read a very short poem written by my grant, which I will end on. So I'll say my goodbyes and housekeeping first. Don't forget you can find the entire back catalogue of interviews on the website. Make sure you subscribe at Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, YouTube, Overcast or wherever else you get your podcasts from to have the podcast downloaded every time. Also remember to leave us a nice rating and review on Apple Podcasts as it really helps others to find the show or just tell a friend. OK, so here's my grand's poem entitled My Mother. The laughter of my children brought back memories and tears. I wondered where each year had gone. Did not seem so very long when I, a child, brought laughter to my mother. No longer here to share my tears. No longer will she come to tea and play with baby on her knee. 
or talk about bygone days and the changing of life's ways. No longer walk with me to shops, to stop for chat, to sit on bench and eat ice cream and watch the fish in the stream. Those happy times will live with me for all eternity. I hope one day my children will think of me that way. Thanks for listening. I'm Wayne Kelly. Happy writing. Stay safe. And I'll see you next time.